My name is Charles Epting, and you're listening to the Lost Labels Podcast. Now, the last couple of episodes have focused on stiff records, and I mentioned an interview with Reckless Eric, which is still forthcoming, but uh, Eric and I had such a great long conversation that I'm still working on editing that one and and getting it posted. So in the meantime, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and cover a musical scene which is fairly new to me personally, but the more I dig into it and the more I uh, discover, the more I, I love it, and it's also got a personal connection for me as well. Belfast, Northern Ireland, and the surrounding cities like Derry, uh, had had a very vibrant punk rock scene beginning in around 1976 uh, all the way through the, the 80s. Um, and, and why this is so important to me personally is my girlfriend Olivia is from a place called Bangor, just north of Belfast. And she's the one who sort of introduced me. You know, I, I knew bands like The Undertones and Stiff Little Fingers. Uh, but she was the one who, who told me that there was uh, a, a whole host of other bands to, to listen to and, and to discover. Uh, as well as the music label Good Vibrations, which uh, has been incredibly eye-opening and fascinating to me as such a devout consumer of music to know that there's this entire uh, scene that was just fairly unbeknownst to me. So Olivia and I were talking one day, and she mentioned uh, one of her mother's friends, Tanya, and she said, Charles, did you know that Tanya's dad used to manage Stiff Little Fingers? You should talk to him sometime. And uh, what I didn't know at the time is not only uh, did, did Colin McClelland manage Stiff Little Fingers, but he also founded the record label uh, that, that released the first Stiff Little Fingers 7-inch, which was Suspect Device. Uh, Rigid Digits Records was basically invented to put this single out. Stiff Little Fingers did not have a label, and they wanted to get this song out into the hands of, of people as quickly as possible. So uh, they basically invented Rigid Digits Records. Uh, as play on words with Stiff Little Fingers, uh, in order to to get Suspect Device out there. And then once uh, Stiff Little Fingers signed to Rough Trade Records, they continued this Rigid Digits uh, name on the first couple of Rough Trade releases, or sort of a dual release between the two labels. So Olivia said to me, would you like to talk to, to Colin? Uh, and, and I immediately jumped on it as um, sort of my first foot in the door into the Northern Irish punk rock scene. So uh, again, Colin McClelland was hugely, he he was a a very successful music journalist before the punk rock scene, uh, became hugely influential in the history of Stiff Little Fingers, and has gone on uh, to have a a very illustrious career in journalism outside of music even. Uh, But but he was kind enough to take some time to chat with me uh, about those early days of, again, not just Stiff Little Fingers, but the entire northern irish belfast punk rock scene so i'm really excited to uh to be able to chat with colin mcclelland colin to start things off can you talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in northern ireland what your first experiences with rock and roll were how you discovered this genre of music okay uh my first contact with rock and roll was elvis presley's first album uh and i remember uh you you know it's hard for people today to understand just how bad communications were back then. Uh, you know, you would hear of something mentioned in a newspaper or a magazine, but to actually hear the record they were talking about could take months before it arrived, you know? Uh, so I remember reading uh, in a show business magazine, and, uh, and I think it was an English show business magazine where they had a guy who uh, wrote from the States to, you know, to keep people <clears throat> abreast with cinema and music and things like that. And he said, there's a new singer on the block with the unlikely name of Elvis Presley. It, it, uh, it's very difficult to hear the lyrics. He sings in a very strange style. But my prediction is that he will unseat Johnny Ray as the top recording artist in the United States. And so that's the leap, the leap from Johnny Ray, who I don't know if you even know the name, but he was, he, you know, he specialized in breaking down and, and, and crying on stage, uh, you know, and he was very fey. I, I think would be the words. And then suddenly you had this explosion that was Elvis singing essentially what was black music. But we didn't know that. We didn't know that, you know, like Lordy Miss Claudy and Mystery Train and all that had been already recorded by notable black artists on what were black labels, I suppose, in the States at the time. 
And uh, so that was my first introduction to it. And when I heard Elvis, I mean, and I recall at home, we had a, my father had, had, was uh, very good with technology, had built a, a radiogram, uh, <clears throat> which we had with pride of place at home. And the radiogram had a massive speaker on it so that when you played Elvis and turned it up loud, you could really hear what it was about. And it horrified my mother. You know, she thought that, that I mean, Elvis, uh, Elvis uh, brought about uh, an awful lot of criticism from mums and dads because he was so overtly sexual, I suppose. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, this thing of wiggling his hips on stage and uh, the the emphasis that he was giving to certain words in the songs, you know, I mean, like it was, he was a teenager's dream because he was something that your parents didn't like. Uh, so I'd say Elvis was my first touchstone, if you like, into the world of rock and roll. And I would have been maybe 12 or 13 at the time when that came out. And I bought, when I could afford it, every album that came out after that. And then that sort of spilled over into Britain, where we had sort of, you know, tame um, lookalikes or soundalikes like Cliff Richard and Adam Faith and people like that who were trying to cash in on the, the tidal wave that Presley had created. Uh, so uh, I think then, you know, we, we labored through that, as you did in the States with all the um, the crooners that, that followed the Bobby Vintons and the Bobby V's and all the rest of it. And, uh, uh, it, uh, it looked like, it looked like rock and roll had gone away. Uh, and then suddenly the Beatles appeared and I didn't, wasn't taking them that seriously at the beginning, but a girlfriend took me along to see a hard day's night. And when I'd seen a hard day's night, it clicked these were the people we'd been waiting for. Because at that stage, we had left, and like Belfast in the 1950s was a very gray and quite desolate place. Uh, you know, it was never an exciting city, if you like. And um, so, like, we were, you know, we weren't used to, uh, we weren't used to new things and, you know, exceptional things culturally. And then suddenly, the Beatles appeared and it, so I think it, they give a focus to, they give a focus to a, a generation re, that remember was a post-war generation. We had more money than, I mean, this is well documented. We were the baby boomers. We had more money. Uh, we had more disposable income uh, and we were looking for uh, role models, I suppose. And, uh, I think it, for some reason it was hard days like the the movie and the album that 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 followed that convinced me that, that this was something genuinely new uh, and that these guys were the new role models and our generation we all followed. I mean the Beatles and then the Rolling Stones and the Kinks and everything that followed afterwards, but the Beatles were the equivalent of Elvis Presley in the 1950s. It's interesting to hear you talk about this lapse in rock and roll between Elvis and the Beatles, because I wonder if that wasn't uh, sort of what punk rock was, you know, 15 uh, years later. Um, you know, by the mid-70s, rock and roll had become very bloated, and you had these arena rock bands, and it probably had lost a lot of the danger that you had when you were listening to the Beatles and Stones and Kinks. Um, so I, I almost see a parallel there between what the Beatles were to Elvis uh, it's kind of like what punk rock was to the Beatles in a way. Uh, precisely, because uh, I at that stage had become a, a pop and rock correspondent for a local weekly newspaper in Belfast. And uh, in those days, we didn't realize that uh, if a band, a big band, came to Belfast as the first gig on the tour, uh, on the UK tour, <clears throat> that it wasn't actually a compliment. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it was the warm-up gig for the rest of the tour in a relatively obscure place. So we had the we had the privilege of being the first to see on their UK tour people like you know um, Fleetwood Mac, the first Fleetwood Mac, Pink Floyd, Queen, Led Zeppelin, 
bands like that, uh, the nice. Uh, and yes, I I must say I can remember going along to Pink Floyd's soundcheck, and I'd heard the albums, and I was I was watching and listening, and I thought to myself, no, I didn't bother going back to the gig itself, uh, although. As a journalist, I had free admission. Um, you know, uh, it, I think it started to hit me around then that, that uh, or the other incident, <laughs> which sort of was a personal thing, was uh, when Cream arrived in Belfast. Now, they were, they were superheroes at the time. And I, through their management, tried to get an interview with one of them. And the only one who would be interviewed was Ginger Baker. So I went along to interview him in the dressing room in the afternoon before the show. And I had my list of questions prepared. Now, they were probably quite naive when I think back on it. Like, you know, who are your greatest influences? And where do you get your ideas? You know, questions. He, he'd probably heard a thousand times before. But I persisted with the questions. And he was lying on the sofa. Um, uh reclining on a sofa and I noticed that after like the sixth or seventh question I wasn't getting a response and I looked over and he was asleep <laughs> he, he fell asleep during my interview and I that to me sort of said like you know these guys aren't ex- as exciting as everybody says they are uh you know this is you know, like he—he was—he, he, he, you know, like it was like somebody who was going through the motions, like with the interview. So was he doing the same thing with the gig itself? You know, that was the way I—I I sort of inter- put it together for myself. Uh, and yes, that all that all that huge orchestral rock with bands like Yes and things, it, it was starting to signal that rock and roll had gone and this new thing had replaced it and it was very clever some of it and it was very musically uh, intelligent but it really wasn't rock and roll because i still remembered elvis presley uh so you're right when punk arrived and i remember gordon ogilvy whose name you'll know who was uh, uh, ended up as co-manager with me uh, he and I would meet, he was a journalist like me in in Belfast, and I had moved into mainstream journalism, but by this, by this stage I was out uh, reporting on the rats and the murders and the atrocities, just as he was. Um, so the journalist had a favourite pub in Belfast called McGlade's, and we would meet there, and Gordon and I struck up a friendship because we had quite, quite a lot in common, and uh, would become aware of the clash and as part of my one of my freelance jobs was i was doing a a column for nme i'm not sure if you're familiar with nme new yeah new musical express um and i did an irish i was their irish uh, correspondent if you like and i remember going along to the first clash gig uh, which was cancelled because they couldn't get insurance and I thought, what what's going on? And I knew the organizers of it. And I talked to them and they said that the insurance company wouldn't insure us because they are punk rockers. And I said, why? What are punk, what, what are they expecting to happen here? And there was a huge police presence outside. And I remember this was, this was in the troubles in Belfast when appalling things were happening, but yet the police found it necessary to send out you know, Land Rovers with with cops in it to make sure that these punks didn't do what? I don't know, set the city on fire. Um, <laughs> it just seems so ridiculous. But it did signal to me that this was something new and that it was, again, like the parents reacting to Elvis Presley. The older generation, especially the people in the insurance companies, couldn't come to terms with this. Uh, that these people were were something new and dangerous, and I think that was the, I think that was the key word maybe that punk brought w- along with it that it was dangerous. There was something beneath the surface that wasn't, 
it wasn't Bobby V and Bobby Vinton and and the, and uh, uh, Pink Floyd. It it was something that you know you weren't going to be you weren't going to be listening to this sitting down in a seat. You, you were you were going to be on your feet when this happened, you know. And then I came for the second Clash gig, which uh, for which they had managed to get insurance, and that went off great. That was a great show. And uh, I didn't know that Jake Burns was part of the crowd there uh, outside. And, uh, uh, you know, so anyway, Gordon and I would would meet and talk about, because we both had a great interest in, in, in rock music generally. And uh, one day, and I don't know if you know the story or not, but how it all happened was that uh, I was... As I say, I was in mainstream journalism at the time, out reporting. Uh, but I also had a weekly column with the newspaper that I worked for, which was quite a big newspaper in Northern Ireland called Sunday News. <clears throat> and um, it was a diary column uh, that was written very tongue in cheek. In other words, it was very irreverent and, and tried to bring tried to tried to bring a bit of humour into the newspaper. And you know, making offbeat comments and dealing with offbeat subjects, <clears throat> and it turned out that Jake Burns was a fan of the of the column I was writing. And one day, I wrote about some band whose name I can't remember now, some Belfast band, and praised them in some way. And Jake wrote me this this letter, which he said he was he was typing on a stolen typewriter uh, in <laughs> in his job with Mackey's, which was a foundry, you know, like an iron works that he, he was working as a, uh, in some clerical job there. And his, his letter to me was, I don't know why you're praising this other band. Uh, if you've never heard of Stiff Little Fingers, we're the best rock and roll band that you will ever see. In fact, that goes so far as to say we're the greatest rock and roll band in the world at the moment. And if you don't come and see us, then you're going to do your readers a great disservice. And I thought that's fat. You know, I was getting a lot of letters into the to the paper, but that sort of stood out for me. So I I replied to him and uh, said, so you know, what evidence can you give me to support this? Have you got a record? And so he said, no, we don't. So we 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 carried on a, a correspondence of like a private correspondence, really, because we. You know, we shared the same sense of humor. And then finally, he said, look, if you want to come and see the band, we're playing at Glen Mackin Stables on the outskirts of Belfast, which was, um, the stables were like the original stables of an old country house that had been converted into performance areas. In other words, you could hire one of the stables uh, to have your birthday party. You could hire it, you know, for a jazz uh, concert you know in other words it was there for for you to hire and whatever you did you it was entirely up to you so they they had hired uh Dan Mack and stables for a gig and that that week i was with i was with gordon and mcglade's bar and we were talking about punk rock again and just making headlines <clears throat> and he said to me you know you know, as an outsider, because he was English and he only recently arrived in Northern Ireland. So he brought a perspective that maybe the rest of us were lacking because we were locals. And he said to me, you know, if punk rock is about disaffected youth and the terrible, boring lives they're leading in England, why isn't there a punk rock band in Northern Ireland? Because the kids here have a much worse life than anybody in England could have because they're living in the middle of a war zone. And I said, well, funny, you should mention that. I said, I've had this correspondence with this guy called Jake Burns who has a band called Stiff Little Fingers. And he said, Stiff Little what? I said, Stiff Little Fingers, that's the name of the band. And I said, I've arranged to go out and see them on Friday night. They're playing at Glenmack and Stables. Do you want to come along? He said, I'd love to, yeah. Uh, so the two of us went along, and there was only about 10 or 12 people in, in the audience. You know, their friends and relatives are coming along. And uh, they brought, I think, I'm nearly sure they brought their gear on a bus. In other words, public transport. And 
they set up on stage. They they set up on stage, and uh, you know there was lots of feedback, and you know the usual amateur stuff that happens with bands, and then they launched into their set. And we were blown away. You know, we thought this they might not be the biggest, the greatest rock and roll band in the world, but they're pretty good for Belfast, you know. And Gordon said to me, "If this is a garage band, he said they've spent a lot of time in the garage." Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we met them afterwards because I went over to introduce myself, and we sat and had a few drinks with them. And, you know, Gordon and I had already discussed before they came off stage what we could do for them. And like we were, we were both full time journalists. That was our career. And it was a very busy job in Belfast, as you can imagine, because of the troubles that were that, that were happening. Uh, so we said to them, look, we, we talked about this and, you know, there's nothing we can do for you except help you with publicity, because that's what we're good at. You know, we know what will make. Uh, column inches in a newspaper and we might even get you a couple of radio players if you get a record together and, uh, but that's as much as we can do because we're fully committed to our careers and they said that's wonderful you know that now I, I, as it turns out coincidentally um, uh, Henry Clooney the original rhythm guitarist of the band is writing a book at the moment and asked me to put to write a foreword for it uh, so I've been in touch with him and he sent me a copy of the first draft of the book. And he he actually said that when they talked to us, it suddenly gave them the feeling that they were somebody after all, because they had no self-confidence as a band because they had rehearsed a hell of a lot, obviously, but nobody was paying any attention to them. And here suddenly were two older guys who seemed to know what they were talking about, who said that they would help them in some way. Uh, and that was the point at which they, uh, you know, they gained a new sort of confidence, according to, to Henry. So anyway, one thing led to another, and we, you know, we set up a sort of press reception for them, you know, invited some of the media along. Uh, I got them a, a slot on Ulster Television, which was the local TV station that, got them onto I think we had a you know a few radio interviews that sort of things like we did what we could we we pulled whatever strings that we had available and at that point Gordon and I didn't know I knew Gordon had always said to me that one of his big ambitions was to write the lyrics for a top 10 single and I didn't pay much attention to that because a lot of people would have the same ambition so uh uh, at the second or third meeting, um, Gordon produced uh, uh, lyrics, and he hadn't told me that he'd written these lyrics. And he pushed them across to uh, he pushed them across to Jake across the table. And he said, "Have a look at that and see if it makes any sense to you." And the lyrics were for Suspect Device, uh, which was their first single, as you may know. And the their there, there was at the time, once Gordon and I got involved, there were conspiracy theories going around that we were like Bengali figures who had been on the lookout for a band to uh, record the lyrics. You know, like we were walking around with pockets full of political lyrics looking for a band to record them, you know, that there were those sort of those sort of conspiracy theories came about, but it was so far from the truth because we went into it almost reluctantly uh, because I, unlike Gordon, I had managed bands before, before I got into journalism. I was involved in a rock club and I was involved in managing bands and I knew what it was like, um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, an unheated man in the middle of the night filled with people and equipment driving 120 miles to play a gig and then having to fight with a promoter over the fee and band falling out or one of them getting drunk or something like that. Uh, you know, it wasn't the life that I would I wanted to repeat. Let's put it that way, because I was married by this stage at two small children and a mortgage and my career in journalism was advancing. Uh, quite well and I thought to myself like 
managing a band. I mean, are you crazy? You can't do this anymore. Uh, but Gordon, having heard the result of the collaboration between him and Jake on Suspect Device, wrote more l- lyrics. And the, but the band, the point I, I'm sorry that I'm trying to make is that the conspiracy theories that that we sort of got the band to record songs about the troubles um, is not true because they had already written several songs uh, based on what was happening in Northern Ireland. Uh, I think "Wasted Life" was was one of the tracks in "State of Emergency." I'm not sure, but there was a couple they had already written because they, you know, they they realised that the material for their anger and, and their frustration was all around them. And uh, so when Gordon and I appeared, it, it was just serendipity that Gordon had also thought about lyrics about Northern Ireland, if you like. So what happened then was uh, we started to move towards the idea of could we make a record? Uh, because, like, we, you know, we were smart enough to know that Nobody was going to fly over from England to look at this band. You had to have a record. I mean, that was your calling card. That was your promotional device. How hard would it be to make a record? And so we did a little bit of investigation and found it wasn't that hard. Uh, and we, we, we set up um, a company called Rigid Digits Limited, which obviously upon them, the name of Stuff Little Fingers, and uh, we uh, asked it around that I had contacts in, like Belfast wasn't coming down with recording studios. I mean, that's, it's, you know, it, was a, it wasn't that sort of city. It was a port city like Liverpool, you know, it, it wasn't uh, uh, a cultural center like London. But I knew uh, some guys in a, in, a, in a radio station and they had a studio they used for recording jingles, advertising jingles. And I also knew a guy who had a recording studio where he recorded anything, you know, from Irish traditional music to loyalist songs to rebel songs to any damn thing that came along, he would record it. Uh, he didn't really care. So I got in touch with him as well. So between the two recording studios, we managed to get a serviceable uh, version of Suspect Device recorded. And then we found that we could get them pressed in Dublin. There was a pressing plant in Dublin. So um, I had no money because I had, as I say, a wife and two children. Gordon didn't. Uh, and he had cash and he said he put up the money uh, to press the first 500 singles, which wasn't that dear. I can't remember what the figure was, but it wasn't that expensive, you know? And um, so we got the, the 500 singles and we then were faced with what sort of sleeve do you put them in? So we designed our own sleeve and the band and us and relatives and friends spent nights gluing these sleeves together to put the records into it. <laughs> and it was really, you know, a cottage industry type of, of thing. Anyway, we, one, of the, uh, one of the singles was sent to John Peel. I don't know how familiar you are with his name. John Peel isn't uh, that well known in the United States, I would say, but it's amazing how many people I've spoken to, particularly in the United Kingdom, uh, point to him as a, a really influential figure. You know, for me at least today, uh, the idea of a, a disc jockey um, sort of breaking punk rock and industrial and so many of the other uh, types of music he was an early adopter of uh, is is fascinating to me. Yeah, he was very influential because what I mean, he he would play music that nobody uh, nobody else would play, uh, and he was responsible for launching both the undertones and Stiff Little Fingers. Um, uh, famously, when the Undertones brought out their single "Teenage Kicks," he played it once and then said, "Do you know that was so good? I'm going to have to play it again." <laughs> and then he he played it back to back, and he was the same with Suspect Device. He said, "That's the greatest punk record I've ever heard." Or words to that effect, uh, and that obviously opened the door. 
because if John Peel gave his imprimatur to something, it it meant that you could uh, use that as a, a very um, influential calling card. And that was when we then started to try to get A and R men over from England to to look at the band. And it was difficult because, I mean, who wants to come to Belfast in the middle of a war to hear a punk rock band? Um, I think Virgin sent two guys over at, at different times, but I can't remember anybody else coming. And uh, by that stage, then it got the story starts to get complicated because, um, and remember, I was still a very much a reluctant co manager of this band because I didn't want to make this my future. Uh, much as I much as I loved the band, uh, I couldn't see myself giving up my job in journalism to go in full time. But by this stage, we had um, received an offer from Island Records uh, for uh, I think a five album deal, um, and I think the advance was something like thirty five thousand pounds sterling, uh, which to us seemed quite a lot of money. And uh, they 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 flew the band over to London, and I think Ed Hollis was the producer, and he took them in and recorded some of the tracks that were later to go on the the album, and uh, said to us, uh, "You can tell the guys to give up their day jobs um, uh, because you know this is more or less signed, sealed, and delivered, and here's the terms of the contract, and this is what we plan to do with you." And everything seemed hunky-dory until the owner of Island Records, Chris Blackwell, who was in the Bahamas at the time, uh, flew back to London and I think said words to the effect of this punk rock thing is just a flash in the pan. It will never last. We're never we're not going to have any punk rock bands on our label. So just cancel anything that you have arranged. So that was a huge letdown that that we thought that the future was now secure because we had an island records contract almost in the bag. And to be told quite categorically, no, there's no chance. Uh, and at that point, the original drummer with the band, Brian Falloon, uh, his girlfriend was putting him under tremendous pressure because like, he wasn't earning any money. And he'd given up his job, and she said, um, "It's either the band or me." I think, and he he left the band, which was a, a crushing blow to them because they'd all gone to school together, they'd grown up together, you know, they'd known one another since they were about twelve. And Brian was the oldest of the band, and maybe you might say the most, the most sensible, and. Uh, uh, when he phoned me, he phoned me to tell me of his decision, and I pleaded with him and tried to persuade him that, you know, this, you know, this was just a setback. This was just one record label. I mean, there were so many other record labels, and we were going to continue to try and and, and uh, fix this problem. Uh, but he said, he, no, he wasn't going to, he wasn't going to go ahead. But he did agree to stay on. Uh, if we if we did get a contract, he would play drums on the album if we done an album deal, uh, and he would he would get a fee for that, you know, a session man fee. Uh, so at this point, um, in amongst other uh, companies coming to talk to us, uh, Gordon uh, developed. Uh, a conversation with Rough Trade. Uh, now, I don't know if you've come across Rough Trade before. They they were essentially uh, a group of hippies who owned a record shop. Is the best way I could describe them. Really nice guys, uh, but with very hippie credentials, if you like. Uh, and the extent of their hippie credentials was that they said that they were they were going to start a record label. And that they wanted to put out an album, and they thought that Stiff Little Fingers might be a good first album for Rough Trade Records. And the deal they offered, now by this stage we were quite conversant with what record companies were offering, which in hindsight was peanuts. You know, like the bands were getting ripped off right, left, and center. 
you know, you would get, you know, 3% of 90% of the, of the sales. And then there was other stuff to be taken off that. It was really awful. The, the, the percentages that they were giving and they were also grabbing publishing rights to you know and only giving the band a, sh- a small share of the publishing rights that seemed to be what the record business was like at the time and by comparison rough trade said look here's the deal what we'll do is we'll record the band and we'll put the record out and we'll take the expenses off the top the combined expenses, and we'll split the rest 50-50. <laughs> that's just unheard of, absolutely unheard of. It, it is the craziest record deal in history, maybe. But that's what we agreed to because it was just, I mean, it made perfect sense. But it was very hippy when you think about it, you know, like we're all in this together and we, we, we're not trying to rip you off. So that's how uh, Inflammable Material came about, the first album. And it was launched to not very, um, you know, not very, I mean, we, the, neither Rough Trade nor, nor us had, had any uh, great reserves of cash to take out full page ads in the national press and do TV slots or anything like that. It was like a word of mouth thing that the album had been released and it went straight in at number 14 in the British top 20. And it also became the first independent label album ever to reach the top 20 in Britain. So historically, it was um, historically it was a landmark, and it was a punk album, and it was the it was, so it was the first independent label to break to have an album in the top 20 in Britain ever. And. I, I saw a recent interview that Jake Burns did, and he he mentioned something that I, I either had forgotten or didn't know at the time, that after it hit 14, it then just disappeared off the charts. And apparently the reason for that was that the people who compi- compiled the charts and, you know, what ranking you got could not believe that this independent label record with no promotion whatsoever had suddenly sold so many copies that it had reached number 14. They thought there was some form of payola going on that, you know, that we were buying up vast quantities of, you know, the old trick of buying up vast quantities of of your own record, but we had no money to do that. (laughs) So, so what they did apparently was they, they, uh, according to Jake anyway, what they did was they quietly removed it from the list because they were suspicious that it had been, it, it had got there by some devious means. So, uh, rather than come out and say to us, we think there's something fishy here. They just quietly didn't include it in the next top 20 listing. So it could, it's quite possible it could have gone higher. I mean, in re, in real terms, it may well have gone higher, uh, and we just didn't know that. So that was that was the launch, and we were, uh, you know, it, it became apparent that uh, that you know once it had done that uh, and it had made history, that the media suddenly w- woke up to this and. They, the band were on the front cover of NME, they were on the front cover of Sounds, uh, Melody Maker, all the top music papers. They were appearing in the national press. And of course, they got a lot of coverage in, uh, in, uh, in Ireland. And always at the back of my mind, though, was the thought that this conspiracy theory that, you know, that they were cashing in on the troubles to sell records, you know, this, this conspiracy theory could abide by, you know, rival bands. I don't know. Uh, Belfast audiences are notoriously unpredictable. Uh, and I knew that from uh, having been to many, many concerts in Belfast, like a band that you thought was going to be received incredibly well, wasn't, and vice versa, uh, because there was, you know, a different perception in Belfast of what made a band valid. And I remember at this point, they got the support slot on the Tom Robinson band, 
British tour. Uh, I don't know if Tom Robinson ever made an Im- impact in the States. They had a, a, a big hit called 2468 Motorway. Uh, and they were very, they were very big in Britain at the time. So they were doing a nationwide tour. And Stiff Little Fingers got the support slot, which was great because it gave them great, great exposure on the uh, on the UK concert scene. So one of the gigs was in Belfast. And uh, I went to the gig because uh, uh, Gordon wasn't in, in, in Belfast at the time. I think he was in London. And I went along just to oversee things. I mean, you know, the usual thing that a manager does, make sure that the band actually gets on bloody stage and that you get paid afterwards. But uh, so they, I was sitting there amongst this, this and it was a sit-down concert, which was the strangest thing, in the place called the Whitlaw Hall, which was part of Queen's University campus in Belfast. And I was still nervous that how the Belfast kids were going to react to the band once they saw them live on a big stage at a big concert. There was still a little niggling doubt in the back of my mind that, you know, that there could there could be a cynicism. I'd say that's maybe the best uh, adjective I can use for what uh, Belfast audiences were like. Um, uh, you know, they... They were cynical. Uh, so, you know, my question was, would, would they have believed all this nonsense about the band being, uh, the, you know, being controlled by these um, uh, Svengali figures, you know, and, you know, was all, all this publicity true about, um, you know, that they wouldn't have made it if we didn't write the lyrics for them, you know, all that sort of stuff with them, you know. I thought this is the home audience. This is their first time coming back home to Belfast before a big audience. You know, is this going to go well or is this going to go badly? And I remember standing at the side of the audience who, as I say, were all seated and it was capacity audience. And once they were announced and walked <clears throat> onto the stage, the crowd as one let out a roar that nearly deafened me because it it was louder than amplified sound. And all of them got off their seats and rushed the stage. And you're talking maybe about, I don't know, 800, 1,000 people, you know. And, you know, I think it was was an emotional moment because, you know, they had got the approval of the home crowd. And Tom Robinson was a very clever guy in terms of presentation because what he did he realized just how big they were with the home audience here so at the end of the tom robinson set for his encore he brought stiff little fingers back on the stage and they they played two numbers with the tom robinson band as a as the uh as the finale to the show which was very good for tom very good for the band as well you know because uh, it's very rare that you find that the headline act will bring a support act on the stage, you know. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so like at that point, I realized that, you know, yes, they had clicked. This was going to work. Uh, and then we had the problem of what to do next, like, you know, because there was great interest from quite a few of the of the record, the major record companies in England. Uh, and, and including Virgin, and I remember we, we had a meeting with Richard Branson uh, because uh, uh, we were trying not to sign with Virgin because we had already almost committed to Chrysalis, and Chrysalis offered a very good deal and also a lot of artistic control over the product. And there was a clause I think Gordon got put into the contract that said, for the and, uh, for the terms of this contract, the word record means a black circular object with a label in the middle <laughs> uh, because record companies were putting out uh you know colored flexi discs and you know uh, uh you know decorated uh singles and you know uh, very unpunk things 
So the band wanted to maintain that sort of artistic control over what the product looked like, apart from what it sounded like. And Chrysalis went along with it, which was great. And in the middle of this, we, we then start to get these these uh, um, overtures from Virgin. And we didn't want to offend Virgin because they, you know, they controlled a lot of the record shops in Britain at the time. That's where they made their, their initial money from. And so we decided that we heard that Richard Branson never met the bands directly for negotiation. That was one of his golden rules. Uh, he he had you know one of his his top executives do it instead, but we said all right we'll have to come up with a list of of demands. What they con- I mean the contract they offered wasn't wasn't very good uh, compared to anything that we'd seen so far. So um, we said the first the first of the terms is that the band insists that we have to meet Richard Branson. And the second one is that we want to have publishing rights for the rest of the world outside the UK. And the third one is, and we went through a list of ridiculous demands, but we'd made them purposely ridiculous (laughs) so that they would just dismiss us as fools and give us a fool's pardon. And that's exactly what happened. We went in and we met Branson. He was a very nice guy. And he just said to us, like, all the things you're asking for are just ridiculous. That's not how this business works. And Gordon, Gordon then went through their contract and destroyed one clause after another, you know, in terms of, of uh, how valid it would be. Um, and we came away from the Branson meeting with them thinking we were just, you know, idiots. <laughs> but, but we had managed not to offend them, which was the main purpose of it. So the band then signed with Chrysalis, and uh, at that point I had taken up the offer of a senior job in Dublin uh, in another newspaper and had moved my family to Dublin. And it was pretty obvious at that point then that, that like my contribution to what happened next was going to be minimal, if not zero. So we, Gordon and I had a meeting and... Uh, we also had a meeting with our accountant in London, a guy called Tony Rose, and he said something to us very, very significant. He said, look, what happens, and he said, I know about this. He said, this is what I do for a living. He said, what happens is this band will get bigger and somebody will come along and try to take the band off you. They'll try to take, out, take over the management of the band. And you may think that unlikely, but it probably will happen. And you will have to go to court in order to in order to re- reclaim your 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 contract with the band. And he said, if you go to court, and the the judge says, so what do you you're full time with this band, are you? And you say, no, we both work as journalists, and we do this in our spare time. <laughs> you're going to lose the action, you know. Uh, so he said, I have to tell you now, this is he used the term shit or get off the pot time. Uh, you're going to have to take a decision now that you either go full time with this band or you don't. And if you don't, then you're going to have to sell your share. In the So we each had a sixth share in rigid digits. Uh, so I sold my sixth back to the band and there was no animosity because we all knew what the, what the story was, I had made my call and had, you know, they weren't surprised because I'd always said I'm not going to be doing this full time uh, in the long term uh, because I have other ideas in mind as to where my career lies. But Gordon, uh, on the other hand, saw a dream fulfilled because he was now involved with the band and he was writing lyrics for some of their songs and um he had now fulfilled his ambition of getting a top, uh, you know, a top 20 song that he had co-authored. <laughs> so, uh, and as I say, he was, <clears throat> he had a girlfriend, but he was single essentially. And he had the freedom to give up his job with the express and go full time with the band, which is what he did. Uh, and I say to people like the remarkable thing about it is when you hear about bands and managers and stuff like that, 
that we've all remained friends in the 40 years that have elapsed since, you know. Uh, like, we're still in touch with one another. And there's still a fondness there, um, you know, between us. And maybe it's just on Facebook Messenger or something like that, but uh, we're, we're all still pals, if you like. Uh, and the band, I'm, you know, I went, went to see them in Dublin uh, two years ago, I think it was, they played the Academy in Dublin. And I said to Jake afterwards, you know, I'm getting too old for this because I don't think my hearing is going to recover for at least a week after after this. I've forgotten how loud you were. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, so that's, uh, that's the story as far as I'm concerned, as far as my involvement was concerned. And as you know, they they broke up, they reformed, and they were up until the COVID-19 restrictions still playing to sell out crowds all over the world. The story of Stiff Little Fingers is a, an incredible one. And I think one of the things that fascinates me so much is the timing of it all. Because had Stiff Little Fingers existed a couple of years earlier, you might not have been able to have your connections in Dublin record the band or get the record in the hands of the right people. And I think that now DIY is uh, taken for granted as a, a cornerstone of punk rock. But you guys were really on the cutting edge. You guys were really making this up as you went along, it sounds like. And I'm sure there were a lot of great bands in the late 60s, early 70s who would have loved to have independently recorded and released music, but they had to content themselves with playing garages or playing local bars. And, and then even to have a label like Rough Trade, where a bunch of hippies get together and, and draft these equitable terms of release, is, again, something very much of this period in the mid to late 70s when, when punk rock was, was being born. And I think it's just so amazing that, you know, Stiff Little Fingers is so much a, a product of being in the right time at the right place, and it allowed them to make such an impact and have such a, a fantastic and, and a long-lived career. Yeah, I think it is too because we didn't we, like, we didn't know how to do this. We we were making it up as we went along, if you like. Uh, you know, we didn't know anybody who had produced a record, uh, and uh, you know, we, uh, and as, as you say, it was like I had contacts because I used to manage bands before, so I knew uh, I knew that there were recording facilities in Belfast, and I knew the guys that ran it. Uh, and uh, if the stiff little fingers thing had happened at any other stage, I wouldn't have had that knowledge. But you're you're right. I mean, it was it was uh, you know it's commonplace now, but we were making up the rules as we went along. Like, you know, where do you get the sleeves printed? I don't know. <laughs> Well, it's funny today. You you know, if you're in a band, you record yourself and then you upload it to Bandcamp or Spotify or YouTube. But uh, again, what you guys were doing, you, you didn't have a roadmap. You didn't know what you were doing or where you were going, but you believed so much in this single. And, and once you put that single out there, the, the, the first 7-inch, it really took on this incredible life of its own. And I think it, it uh, shows that your efforts were um, you know, really well-placed. And I, I think, again, the, the way that single uh, caught fire and, and rough trade picking it up shows that uh, even though you were kind of making it up as you went along, it uh, it certainly paid off. Yeah, well, it, I I can I can remember vividly that when we got the acetate of, of uh, suspect device, because we still didn't know, you know that you know was this a great record or not? We you know, um, uh, Gordon got the acetate and he brought it up to my house because believe it or not, stereo was still pretty much in its infancy at the time. You know, to have a stereo uh, record player. And he brought it up to my house where I had a stereo record player, a very rudimentary one. And we put the single on and played it and turned the volume up. And at the end of it, we looked at one another and he said, do that again. And I put it on again. And I turned to him and said, shit, that's good. He said, <laughs> and he said, yes, yeah. He says, I think it is, isn't it? And we were trying to reassure ourselves that it was as good as we thought it was. <laughs> and that sort of leads into the last thing I want to ask you about, because I listen to Suspect Device and Alternative Ulster and Gotta Get Away uh, all the time today. These are some of my favorite songs. I think they hold up unbelievably well and sound so fresh to this day. 
Can you talk a little bit about why you think that is? What you think the legacy of a band like Stiff Little Fingers is? Or uh, just the Northern Irish punk scene in general? Um, wh- why are people still interested? I, I, I know plenty of people when I go to record stores in New York. They talk about these bands like Protex or, uh, you know, again, e- even the bands that, that didn't quite make it are, are still so beloved today. Why do you think that is? I think because it was based on reality. It, it, it wasn't people sitting down to write a song about, you know, uh, what they thought being unemployed might mean. It was written by kids who had nowhere to go. And if they did try to go somewhere, they could be killed. You know, quite literally, uh, you, you know, pubs were being blown up and car bombs set off in the streets without warning. Uh, it was an extremely dangerous place to be. And when you're a teenager, you want to go out and you want to enjoy yourself. And they couldn't do that. So the level of frustration and anger that was building with these kids. And the other thing that we noticed was that punk transcended the sectarian barrier that the kids turning up for the gigs were half Catholic, half Protestant. And that just didn't happen anywhere, you know? And uh, it was a, like, it was a remarkable step that these kids were actually, that was part, if you like, of the protest. We are going to follow this, this band or this music, regardless of, I mean, I couldn't tell you at the moment what the religion was of the original Stiff Little Fingers of of every member. I could guess. But it never became a talking point. And that's because it was part of the punk ethos in Belfast that, that punk rock was for the kids and it didn't matter what religion you were or what political affiliation you had. This was our music. And we were going to play it and we were going to listen to it and we were, we were going to go to the concerts. And we don't care about the religious aspect of the culture that has prevailed in this place for so many hundred years. Uh, so I think to answer the question more succinctly, maybe, that it was uh, like the music that they were, they, they were composing and playing and they were playing it with a ferocity that perhaps English bands and Scottish bands didn't, or even American bands didn't have. It. The ferocity came from the anger and from the, 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 the sheer desperation of the situation that they found themselves in. Because I have to say to you, like, it was bleak. Living in Belfast was bleak during the Troubles. There was no hope. There was no light at the end of the tunnel. There was no future. There was no promise that things would get better. So that's what they were facing. So that's all encapsulated, I think, in the music that came out. I think it's really kind of funny that people love to talk about how bad New York City was in the 1970s, how dirty and grimy and crime-ridden the city was. Uh, But it's always with sort of a nostalgic, wistful tone, I feel. Um, You know, for as bad as it was, I think people tend to romanticize it. Uh, in retrospect, whereas what was going on in Belfast, people in New York didn't know how, how good they had it compared to Belfast and Derry and the rest of Northern Ireland. This was really a war zone. Yeah, I mean, it was it was like living through a nightmare. And the one thing it taught me was that humans will adapt to anything. You know, uh, I often quote my poor dear mother who's high dead, and she lived in a house in an area that was very middle class before the Troubles. And eventually, as you know, the demographic lines kept shifting, you know, an area that was predominantly Catholic would become predominantly Protestant as the Catholics fled and vice versa. So and then you would have interfaces where there would be people trying to kill the people in the next street, Uh, uh, which is literally true, uh, and burn them out of their houses. And what happened to my mother was that over a period of time, Gradually, this nice middle class area that she lived in became surrounded by a sea of flames, if you like. Uh, And to get to where she lived, you had to drive through some very dangerous places. And my brother and I at one stage said to her, look, mom, we think it's time you got out of here. We'll sell the house. We won't get as much for it as you 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 were expecting. We'll move you to the south of Belfast, which is much more peaceful. And she said, why? And we said, well, because, you know, there was somebody shot up on the main road there the other day. But all my friends are here. 
like like two friends, you know, and she she was widowed, you know, and and she said, but all the shops I know are here, and we said, but half of them have been blown up. But I know, but this is still where I live. This is where you know. And I thought, yeah, I I I get this. I understand this. She has adapted. She has a. This is the new normality for her. And she's accepting it. And moving it is more difficult for moving is more difficult for her than staying. So that was Belfast. I mean, it just it changed so much about how people lived. But the the forgotten victims were the teenagers because you know we were all teenagers. We remember what it was like. You wanted to get out and about and meet meet people of your own age and listen to your own music and dress in your own clothes and. And, you know, talk about subjects that you shared. And Belfast teenagers were, teenagers were denied that. They couldn't leave the house. You know? And if they did, they were taking a terrible risk. And they had to tell lies to their parents about where they were going. Because, you know, going anywhere outside your immediate area invited danger or even death. So that's where the music came from. Uh, so Gordon was right. Uh when he said that, you know, of punk rock, of all the places in the world where, where there should be punk rock, it should be Northern Ireland because the teenagers here have so much more to put up with than anywhere else in the world. And that was his perspective, as I said, was good because it came from outside. We didn't say it that way, but he did. He was the one who identified that. I want to thank Colin again, and and from here, uh, Lost Labels is going to continue to dig into the Northern Irish scene. I've had great conversations with Martin from The Outcasts and Brian from Rudy, who are two of the most iconic, uh, important bands of uh, of the Belfast punk scene. So that's going to be uh, where Lost Labels goes from here. I have a lot of other great conversations lined up. We're going to go to Minneapolis. We're going to go back to London. We're going to go back to New York. Uh, and and I'm really excited about uh, about what's to come. But but for now, huge thank you to Colin uh, for taking the time to talk and for making Stiff Little Fingers happen for for realizing the potential that this band had and and you know finding a way to get their music uh, into the hands of the fans and and to make sure that their legacy uh, is what it needed to be is what it deserved to be. So uh, as always, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Charles Epting. This is the Lost Labels podcast. Until next time.